Winston Scott, retired U.S. Navy captain and U.S. Naval aviator. I um, was also a NASA astronaut to space shuttle missions. I'm currently the uh, senior advisor to the president at Florida Institute of Technology. Until recently, I was senior vice president, but I'm semi-retired, so my title now is senior advisor. So I'm in higher ed now at the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, Florida. I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. So I'm back home now in the state of Florida, but actually born and raised in Miami. And uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I, uh, our communities and schools during my early education was segregated. So all the black kids lived, of course, in the black community and we went to all black schools. And uh, my 10th grade year, schools integrated. So 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, my uh, uh, friends and I, from all black Miami, uh, Coconut Grove transferred to Coral Gables High School, which was the historically white high school. Uh, growing up in Coconut Grove, uh, it was really a, a good childhood. The Grove was clean, it was neat. People uh, took a lot of pride in the businesses. Our teachers were great in school. We, we didn't have the uh, kind of equipment that you'd like to have uh, in our labs, for example, in, in, in the science education rooms and things like that. But the teachers were outstanding. They knew their stuff and they really had our best interests at heart. When we transferred over to Coral Gables, it was a whole new world. Being on that campus, it was known as a high school, it seemed like what I thought would be a small college. It was so big, it was neat and clean, the equipment, the facilities, the books. You know, at, at Carver, we had hand-me-down books that were left over from someplace else. At Coral Gables High School, they actually had a bookstore on campus. So if you had a, a particular class and the teacher said, okay, we're gonna read this book for the class, you went to the bookstore on campus and bought the book. Now, that's what you do in college. Integrating Coral Gables was not a difficult time for us. We uh, uh, moved right in. We immediately start playing sports, playing the band and uh, uh, chorus and other activities. So it was a relatively smooth transition for us in those days. I remember exactly where I was when uh, Dr. King was assassinated. And I remember a lot of the civil rights activities going on. I can also remember of the, the riots going in different parts of the country in different parts of the South, but none of that was actually in my specific neighborhood. So I knew about it, I knew what was going on, and we talked about it. I can remember the disappointment on, on everyone's fa faces when you got the word that Dr. King had died, but, but in knowing how important it was, it was still off a distance. It wasn't right there in my neighborhood. I could walk outside in the front yard and see it happening. Uh, but but it was a period of important changes, as I said. In fact, I can remember in my ninth grade year when it was decided that schools were going to integrate and our class the following year could go to Coral Gables. I remember our parents would, would uh, talk to us about it and talk about what a great opportunity it was going to be to attend Coral Gables High School. Again, not because the teachers were any better, but the facilities were so much better. You know, we didn't have very nice facilities that carved like the Dickett Gables. So our parents were, were, were talking to my brother and, and me about uh, what a great opportunity it was going to be and how we needed to go over there and do the best we could, how we needed to conduct ourselves in such a way that we'd represent our neighborhood uh, in, in, in a very, very positive manner. So uh, my integration of schools was sort of a, uh, it was against the backdrop of the largest civil rights movement which was often violent in other places, but, it, but the violence didn't necessarily it lend itself right there where we live. It, it wasn't until late in college that I thought about aviation as a career field. I, uh, I was always, a, I was a very good musician. I was very, in fact, I was a gifted musician. I was writing music in eighth grade and ninth grade, arranging music and playing, and playing gigs. In fact, I was playing gigs with some famous people but I was also very interested in technical things. I was the kind of kid that, that opened up his toys at Christmas to see how they worked. You know, I played with batteries and light bulbs and motors. I was always trying to build something, but I didn't know what engineering was. I had no one to guide me and tell me, if you like doing that kind of thing, you should study engineering. I didn't know. So I thought you had to go, when you went to college, you had to major in something that you were already good at. Well, I was really good at music. So I thought, okay, I have to major in music. 
So I got into uh, Florida State University College of Music uh, upon the recommendation of my band director. But while majoring in music, I got exposed to engineering. One night, my roommate, my roommate was an engineering major. I happened to glance over his shoulder and saw what he was doing in his homework. And something sort of clicked inside of me. And I'm saying, I'm supposed to be doing that. I started taking math and science and engineering as an overload. I was taking 21 hours a, a quarter because I was taking engineering courses in addition to my music courses. So uh, I was getting ready to graduate because again, this didn't occur until late in my college career. So I didn't have enough time remaining to do a degree in music and a degree in engineering. I was gonna finish my music degree and I started wondering to myself, well, how can I pursue a degree in engineering? I heard the military was in the school. I didn't know anything about the military. There's nobody to guide me along and I had no idea. I just sort of wandered in to the uh, Air Force office and took their qualifying test. It's the test they give people who just walk in off the streets like me. No ROTC or anything, I just wandered in. And the Air Force was taking so long to process my application that again, no guidance, it suddenly hit me, Navy. Navy has airplanes. And those Navy guys must be good. And then everywhere I looked, something about naval aviation would jump out at me. So I drove to the Navy recruiter's office, took the same battery of tests and the Navy responded quickly. And I was off to aviation officer candidate school and the rest, as they say, is history. So I begin my Navy career and years go by, I continue to advance and, 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 and do pretty well. And then it came down to the point where, where I was, NASA was going to select astronaut candidates. It was about my 18th year in the Navy. So I made up my mind, I'll apply one time and see what happens. And then I put my application together, singing in, and a year and a half later, they kept, they kept narrowing the, the, the field down. We had about 3,000 people apply and every cut, my name kept staying in there. And lo and behold, a year and a half later, I was selected. But I don't want the people who are listening to misunderstand, you know, it wasn't an easy process. It wasn't, I just sit down and do nothing and it came at me. I worked hard, I studied, I, I excelled, I had op obstacles came in front of me, I had to overcome some stumbling blocks, you know, you work your way through things. That's how life is. We all have to work our way through obstacles, but uh, I never gave up. I think the biggest challenge probably was just perseverance. But as I say that, it, 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 I, that's just how I am. I just, just never gave up. I just couldn't conceive of, of giving up. NASA, I think, is, is a very, very good organization in many, many ways and in terms of inclusiveness. I think NASA does a, a really pretty good job at attempting to be inclusive. NASA will specifically recruit uh, all racial minorities, the ethnic minorities, and men and women. So I think NASA does a pretty good job becoming an astronaut is a technical subject. So the degree has to be in a technical field in engineering or physics or or whatever. And then you have to have an advanced degree, you know, uh, at least a master's degree, uh, and then experience, you know. Uh, military pilots typically have a master's degree. Some have PhDs, but then a lot of hours of flight time and, uh, and research and development experience. Uh, the civilians may have a PhD and then research and development experience. So education and experience is the key. And then I would urge young people today, if you want to be an astronaut then, Focus on becoming the world's leading expert in something that's needed to fly in space. In today's environment, of course, you don't have to go to the military to be an astronaut. But what I would urge young people to do is when they're considering a career field, just consider the military. I will say that, uh, that military service and training gives you experiences that you never get in civilian life. But at the same time, it's not for everybody. And as our access to space improves and advances, there are gonna be more and more opportunities to get into space without having served in the military. But I can think of many people who helped me along the way. Some of my mentors, I could, I could name people who along the way were supportive of me and helped me and they were there when I needed help. And so they might not have specifically been astronauts, but they were there, they guided me, they mentored me, they helped me along. And I think each one of us has an obligation to reach out and help other people. One thing I have to thank, the, the family environment, my mother and father, 
that, that we came out of because they instilled in us the basic values of, of doing the best you can at everything and not giving up. There's no words to describe it. You know, when we uh, launched on my first flight, I had, we had been training for a little over a year for that flight. And uh, finally, we were down to the day of, day of launch, say day of launch, we really launched that night. We went out to the launch pad, like, uh, I guess it was around midnight because we launched at 2 something a.m. So it was dark outside. And anyway, anyway, when you're sitting on the pad, you, you actually strap into the shuttle maybe three hours, two and a half, three hours before actual liftoff. So you're lying on your back for a long time as the clock counts down and the systems are gradually powered up and testing and so on. But anyway, the action starts at about seven seconds before liftoff and the, when the ground launch sequencer ignites the main engines. So I was the, I was mission specialist too. So I was the, the flight engineer. I was part of the flight deck crew, the people that actually operated the vehicle. So when I'm, I'm lying there and all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, I knew it was coming because I could hear the countdown. I could see the countdown on the, went on the, the uh, console in front of me, but the computers will ignite the three engines and they start to rumble and shake. And then all this fire and smoke billows up around the front windscreen. And when the clock hits zero, it jumps off the path. That's the thing that, that's the first thing that surprised me because when you watch rockets on TV or in real life, it looks like they float up in slow motion. This thing, boom, it exploded off the pan. It kicked me in the, in the backside and it was shaking and vibrating. It wasn't smooth the way it looks on TV. We, uh, I, I always like to throw the stats out, but we passed 100 miles per hour before you clear the tower. And then we roll kind of over to upside down and you accelerate and you pass Mach 1 and I think on that flight, we passed Mach 1 in 43 seconds. And then we just continue to go faster and faster. It pushes you back into your seat. And one of the things I can re I remember, because I, I have some gauges to monitor, the computers are really controlling everything. If everything works properly, the computers are controlling it. I just have some systems to monitor as we went uphill. So I'm partially uh, enjoying the ride and ooh, ah, and how fast this thing is going, but actually also monitoring my gauges to be sure the, uh, every, all the systems were operating properly. At uh, two minutes after liftoff, that's the end of the first stage. So you have a big explosion and uh, the solid rocket boosters would jettison away from you and then the throttles come up again, push you back and you see you start accelerating. But one of the things that really got me was, again, we launched at night dark outside. About halfway through the asset, I could look out of the front window and see the day half of the earth coming. So as we accelerated from sitting on the pad to 17,500 miles per hour, we went from nighttime through a little gray area called the terminal right into bright sunlight. And then we're orbiting the earth over and over again at 17,500 miles per hour. So and I remember thinking to myself, man, we've been training for over a year for this asset. And then it's over, just like that, eight and one half minutes. All of that went by so fast and it was, it was over. All that training we did, it, now we're in orbit. And uh, it's just uh, an incredible experience, an incredible uh, experience to look out and back at the Earth. When we hit orbit, I was the first one to get out of my seat because of where it was located. I had to get out of my seat. and. Uh, take a camera and, and film the external tank as it, fil as it flew back into the atmosphere. And uh, uh, just being able to look out of the overhead windows and see the earth beneath me like that was just, uh, again, no words can describe it. And it's just, just amazing. <laughs>